All right, let's turn to Matthew 26. This being what a lot of folks call Palm Sunday, I thought it'd be appropriate to do something concerned with things that happened before the crucifixion. Now, I don't want to get into all this right now, but if you study the days of the week and days that it's possible Christ was crucified, it makes it impossibility for him to have been crucified on Friday. So we'll have Good Friday this week, and some of you may have the day off from work or we have it off from school, and nothing wrong with having that day off, but just understand that if you go from Friday around 3 p.m. to Sunday morning around 06 a.m., that comes out to be about 36 hours in the grave. It's impossible for Jesus Christ to have died on Friday. Wednesday makes more sense. There might be a possibility for a Thursday. Now, I, I'm not saying that to get into all the ins and outs of that now. I just say that because you'll see days mentioned here. And I think that our passage we're reading in the crucifixion week, I don't believe this happened on a Sunday, what we're about to read, but very likely on Monday or Tuesday. So just to give you a little idea of the crucifixion week and how all that happened, look at Matthew 26, verse 1. I'm going to read all the way down to verse 16. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he saith unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people under the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and be given to the poor and given to the poor. Verse 10, and when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble you the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. And let me stop right there. Today is almost 2,000 years since this event happened. And we just read about this woman. So this woman has been memorialized, wouldn't you say? This great work that she did. And we'll say more about her in a moment. Look at verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. So the message this morning is preparation for the crucifixion. You understand that these things that were recorded here in these first 16 verses are on purpose and they are important events leading up to the crucifixion of Christ. So I'm going to pray and I'll just ask you to pray as well that God would use this particular passage and others that we look at to show us things about the past, also about the present, about ourselves, and also some things about things to happen down the road that will happen. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that we have preserved copy of your words in front of us. We, we take that as a great responsibility and privilege that we have exactly what you want us to have in front of us on the written page. I know my prayer and I know your desire is for all of us to read, believe, and understand and apply these things that we've looked at. And we know that none of this will take place without your Holy Spirit really putting the light on the scripture for us and the light in our individual hearts today. And I pray that you would just stir us up in our hearts that we would really be about doing something in these last days for you and not really care what this world thinks of us. I just pray that we would glean some great truths that we can apply today. And we pray that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be exalted. And we pray that you would be the, be the one glorified today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So up to this point in history, the most important event in the history of the world that has taken place is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sherry mentioned this morning she had taught her kids this past week about the calendar. Did you know our calendar revolves around one person? And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the older folks that are here today, 
When you were in school, like me, you learned B.C. 4000 B.C. is about the time of Adam and Eve, according to genealogies in your Bible. Uh, 606 B.C. is the time of the Israelites and their Babylonian captivity. B.C. stands for what, folks? Before Christ, before his birth, before he was here on earth, born of a virgin and lived for 33 and a half years. And then you have, again, you older folks, remember that you dated things A.D. We are living in 2023 A.D. And I'm still saying A.D. Anno Domini. It's Latin for, anybody know? The year of our Lord. In the public education world, they've gotten rid of B.C. And they changed it to B.C.E. Isn't that ignorant of them? And I'm being nice when I say ignorant. B.C.E., before the common era. Who'd they take out? They took out Christ. And then they changed it to C.E. instead of A.D. C.E. being the common era. They took out the Lord from the modern day way we have of dating things. So I say all that, and this is a great place to start this morning. The world is against the Lord Jesus Christ. In Sunday school this morning, God put a physical illustration in the skies. You have to go back and listen to that. How the world and the sun go against one another. Now, did you catch what I said? The world and the S-U-N. But you can also make a really good case in your Bible for the world being against the S-O-N. Keep that in mind. You'll see that we're going to look at three different people today, or one group and then two individuals. And you'll see that two out of the three that we will examine this morning are against Jesus Christ. Indicating that if you are going to live for Jesus Christ, you will most likely be in the minority. But that's okay. Do you want to win or lose? Hey, if you're in the minority, you're on the Lord's side, you win. So it doesn't matter how many people may be against you now. And it doesn't matter if they appear to be winning now. The last time I checked, a game has a time that passes. In baseball, it's innings. And in basketball and football, it's a time that runs out. You know that you can be losing all during the game and win the game? I want to win the game. I don't care about things that happen along the way that may appear like we're not winning the game. I want to win in the end. So let's take a look this morning at some groups of people. These are things that prepared the way for the crucifixion. And I'll say this about Jesus Christ. Actually, I got to say one more thing about the Lord. It says it came to pass in verse 1 when Jesus had finished all these things. We'll start with Jesus this morning. Every single detail in the life of Jesus Christ was on purpose. You ever consider that he never went and took a wrong step? A great place to go for a personal application is Psalm 37, 3. You don't have to turn there, but you might want to write it down. Here's what it says. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Uh, don't you want the Lord to delight in your way? If that's a yes, I hope it is, then your steps need to be ordered by the Lord. And every single step that Jesus Christ took was ordered by the Lord. So everything in this passage is on purpose. So let's take a look here. Verse 2 says, you know, this is Jesus talking. You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be what? Now hold on a second. You mean to tell me that the Lord knew he was going to be crucified? Folks, you look at the gospel accounts many times. The Lord said he would go to Jerusalem. He told his disciples this. He would go to Jerusalem. He would be betrayed. He would be crucified. Oh, but don't forget, he would rise again. He predicted that, and he accurately foretold that. So I, I stop here for a moment just to remind all of us that the life of Jesus Christ was not an easy life, but it sure did please God, right? And if you're going to live, live your life for Jesus Christ, folks, there's just no way around it. There will be some great trials along the way. It will be difficult. So be prepared to face the difficulties, prepared to face the challenges that come about. And the challenges a lot of times will come about just because you're choosing to live your life for the Lord and you're going against the grain of the world. Be ready for those challenges. But hey, if the Lord has you go through some tough times and some trials and tribulations, if he allows it, won't he see you through to the end? Okay, I got one amen there. All right. Hey, if the Lord allows you to go through a difficult time, if he allows it, 
He'll see you through it. Anybody ever been through a tough time and the Lord saw you through that? Amen to that. Brother Paul's not here this morning. Brother Paul's been through a real tough time. Miss Linda is right here this morning. She went through a real tough time here. Total by surprise, right? You didn't expect that. Brother Paul with the cancer diagnosis, totally by surprise. We don't expect these things. And it's been a great testimony to see folks in our local church here who have been through, I mean, they've been through quite a time here. And all along they said, Lord, I don't understand it. I don't get it at all. I, don't, I didn't see it coming, but I'm going to trust you. Make sure that that's the approach you take when tough times come. Well, only, only the Lord will get you through, amen? You know, other, other ways to try to get through are not going to work. Only the Lord will see you through that. So even though Jesus Christ knew what was coming, think about what he knew was coming. He knew in a couple of days he would endure the most painful of deaths. He knew that he would be beaten by the Romans, the, the masters of torture and crucifixion. He knew that he would have to endure the driving of nails through his hands and his feet. He knew that he would hang on the cross for several hours and endure the shame associated with crucifixion. He knew all of this was coming, yet he did not try to escape. And you know why he did that? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Amen. He knew all that was coming, and he did it for a bunch of sinners like all of us sitting here this morning. Now, let's read verses 3 through 5, and this is where we get to some very, a very interesting group of people. It says, verse 3, Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people under the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. All right, you want to note something. There's three groups of people, chief priests, scribes, elders, and then there's a fourth, the high priest himself. All three of the groups of people, and then the high priest himself, all of them would be considered high religious people. I mean, they're way up there on the hierarchy list. All of them would be way up on the list of important religious people. So you would expect very important religious people to do that at which is right, correct? Look what they do in the next verse, verse 4. And consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. Folks, they, you would expect for all these people that are high on the religious hierarchy to do the right thing, but verse 4 indicates they want to kill the only righteous person that has ever lived, the Lord Jesus Christ. So they conspire to kill him. It says there they consult. The other gospels, you'll find one that says they conspired. And uh, don't, don't get all scared when I use that word conspiracy, okay? I know that uh, that's, there's a lot of uh, nonsense going on with conspiracies today, but here's what a conspiracy is. A secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. Isn't that exactly what's happening here? Secret plan, they want to hurt somebody. So always get the Bible whenever it comes to certain words that are buzzwords in our world today and make sure you get what the Bible says about it. But notice in verse 4, interesting wording here and purposeful wording. Verse 4 again, it says, They consulted that they might take Jesus how? By subtlety and kill him. Okay, let's take a look at this word, subtlety. Words are important in your Bible. You want to pay attention to certain words in your Bible. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Here's the first point here. You have a conspiracy or a consultation. And the group of people involved are all religious people. Go to Genesis chapter 3. It says there they wanted to take Jesus by subtlety. That is a word that you need to know a little bit about of in your Bible. So we're going to look at two passages that have to do with the word subtle. Notice it says the chief priests, elders, scribes consulted by subtlety. So look at verse 1 of Genesis 3. Let's see where this subtlety comes from. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Okay, so the first person in the Bible that is mentioned as being subtle is who? The serpent. You do a little Bible study, you find out that the serpent is the devil. He's called the dragon. He's also called Satan. And here he's called the serpent. It says he was more subtle, subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And look what this subtle serpent does. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Folks, the first person in your Bible who's subtle gets this woman, that's Eve, 
to take a forbidden fruit. And the strategy he uses is questioning what God said. Is there anything new under the sun these days, folks? There's nothing new under the sun. You can believe that if the, certain, the serpent is the first one in your Bible who's subtle, and the subtlety he uses is to question what God said, the same strategy is at work today because it's effective. Folks, let me ask you a question. Do you have in front of you what God said? Do you? Do you believe that every word in your Bible is preserved perfectly by God and it is truly what God said? Okay, amen to that. Now, did you know that in churches, yes, I said churches, where religious people gather today, men will stand in pulpits and they will say, now the word you see over there should be translated differently than what you see on the page. You know what they're doing? They're questioning what God said. And I, I know that this comes up from time to time here at church. Folks, you better believe that you have a copy of God's perfectly preserved words. And if you don't believe that, you will be taken by subtlety to believe a lie. Folks, the devil's in the business of questioning what God said. Go back to Matthew 26. Notice that if you were to study the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, oftentimes in the gospels, they come to Jesus Christ and they ask questions and they question him concerning his true identity. And what they want to cast doubt on is whether he's truly God manifest in the flesh. Is he truly the Messiah, is he truly God's only begotten son? And folks, the only way you're going to know who Jesus is, is to have a perfectly preserved copy of what God said. And if you don't get the right English Bible, it will actually lead you to believe that maybe Jesus Christ is not God manifest in the flesh. And I don't want to get off on this right now, but a lot of your modern English translations sure do cast doubt on the deity of Jesus Christ. You know who translates English Bibles? Religious people. People high on the list of importance of the religious crowd. So I just got to remind all of us, and I, hey, I know this forwards and backwards, and I, I could teach this, and I love talking about it, but hey, I need to be reminded on the regular, on the daily, I have what God said written. I can trust it. I can believe it. And I don't have to lean on a scholar to have understanding of my Bible. I need to lean on my relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God to show me the truth of what he said. Amen. You should always check what the preacher or the teacher says by looking at what you have in your perfectly preserved copy of God's word. Amen. And I say that to warn you about the religious crowd. The religious crowd here is out to kill Jesus Christ. Now go back to your New Testament. Go to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Look at this word subtlety again. And you'll see that there are religious people out there. But religious people are not always right. In fact, oftentimes a religious crowd is wrong. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3. Looking at this word subtlety with this group of people. This religious crowd, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. This is the Apostle Paul giving a warning here, and it's a good one. He says, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his what? Subtlety. He reminds us of what we just read in Genesis 3. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the, what's that next word? simplicity that is in Christ. Paul's fear was that the subtlety of Satan would result in a mind being corrupted and would keep a person from the simplicity that is found only in Jesus Christ. Can I tell you how simplicity, the gospel, how simple the gospel of Jesus Christ is and the simplicity that is found in Christ? Let me just take, I'm going to see if I can take 15 seconds. You ready? Christ died for your sins and mine. I'm a sinner, are you? He was buried because that's what they do with people who die. 
But unlike all other dead people throughout history, he rose from the dead. Today, he promises anybody who believes that he paid the price for their sins and rose again, if you will call upon him to save you, he will forgive you of all your sins and give you everlasting life. Amen. Now, it took me maybe 20 seconds, but hey, how simple is that? Isn't that simple? You don't have to go through this class or this course or this particular place and then do that. There's not all these steps involved in salvation. It's a matter of understanding that you are a sinner and you deserve hell. Christ suffered God's wrath on the cross for you so you don't have to go to hell. He paid the price for sinners, but he rose again, proving that he's God manifest in the flesh. And he's waiting on anybody and everyone today to call on him to save them because he wants to save you. Isn't that simple? Now, have you been saved? Have you trusted in that simple formula of calling on Jesus Christ, understanding the great price he paid for you? Have you done that? I hope you have. If you have not, I hope today you understand the simplicity in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't let the world, and the world's really good at this because the world's controlled by the devil. Don't let the world corrupt your mind. People reject Jesus Christ today because their minds are blinded. You go back to 2 Corinthians 4, the devil's in the blinding business. Not the blinding of physical eyesight, but the blinding of minds to keep people from the gospel. Now, you came to a place today that is well lit. Amen? It says over there in 2 Corinthians 4, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. You came into a place that is well lit today because here you will hear the truth of what God said. And the entrance of God's words give you light. And Jesus Christ himself, John 8, 12, is the light of the world. He that believeth in me shall not abide in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I hope that you have that today. And if not, you can get that very easily. By the way, you don't have to wait until the end of the message to get that. You don't have to walk down here. You can do it right now in your seat. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I've sinned against you. I know that I deserve hell, but I believe that you died and rose again for me. Would you save me? And if you didn't remember the words I just said, that's okay. It's not a magic formula of words. It's a matter of you believing and calling on Jesus Christ. Now make sure I include that today. I never want to assume that everybody's on the same page here. So if you don't know who Jesus Christ is, you can get to know him today. Now the devil's out to distract you from what is most important. You know, spiritual is more important than physical. You know, you, if you have not had breakfast this morning and you're still, uh, you're still in a fasted state, I, I would guess you're probably going to eat lunch. Isn't food important to you? Physical food is important to me. I, I'm just going to be honest. I love to eat. I have to be careful because I, that's one of the things I have to watch out for when it comes to uh, sins is eat more than I should. I like to eat physically. I know my body needs food, at least a certain amount, more than, not more than I need, but a certain amount. Now, hey, you know what's more important than physical food is spiritual food because the spiritual is more important than the physical. And this Bible that you have, hopefully you have one today, this Bible is spiritual meat for you, spiritual drink for you. And you need this more than you need physical food. What was the first temptation in the wilderness for Jesus Christ? Turn these stones into bread, physical food. And the Lord responded. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the spiritual, every word of God. So understand the spiritual is more important than the physical. The world would have you think that politics are more important than the spiritual. Don't fall for that nonsense. The world that would have you think that Physical monetary blessing is more important than spiritual blessing. Don't fall for that one. That's a lie. Get in on the spiritual blessings that are found only in Jesus Christ. Those are the ones that are most important because those are the ones that never go away. How many ha ha have a car in here? Is it getting better or worse? Okay, I, I mentioned the day I had four Camaros in my life. I loved Camaros for many years. I still do, but I just don't have one right now. My 81 Camaro burned up. My 85 Camaro wrecked, and then the, the, I, had to, I had to sell it, and the engine went out. The, the 89 Camaro wrecked again, yep. The 99, the 99 Camaro uh, I had to sell because the engine went out. So look, wrecks and engines, just it, it'll mess up a car, won't it? They don't last forever. Now, those things, I loved driving them, and they were a ble physical blessing to me while I drove it because I thought it was cool, you know, driving a Camaro, of course. But they're all gone. 
But all along, you know what I have had in my possession? Spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. I had them then, I got them now. I'll have them in 100 years. You say, you're going to be dead in 100 years. I'll still have them. I'll have them in 1,000 years. Get in on the spiritual. It's so much more important than the physical. Now, the devil's out to cast doubt on God's word. I mentioned that. And he's also out to destroy you. You ever thought about this? The devil's out to destroy you. Now, if he can't kill you physically, he'll try to destroy your testimony, won't he? You've got to stay on guard. You've got to be sober and vigilant 24-7 or you'll lose your testimony. You know that it only takes one step away from the Lord and your testimony for, before the world can be absolutely ruined, right? I've known preachers along the way that they, they had a great ministry going, had a great testimony for the Lord. One foolish decision resulted in the, everybody that they influenced saying, well, that guy was a fraud. One thing, stay as close to Jesus Christ as you possibly can, or you got to watch out. The devil's out to destroy your testimony. The devil's out to destroy your family. The devil's out to, to take whatever he can. John 10, the thief cometh but to do three things, to steal... Don't let him steal your spiritual blessings. Don't let him steal God's word from your heart. He's out to kill and he's out to destroy. Can't you see those three things at work in events of the past week? Still kill and destroy in our world I'm talking about here, really close to home. So this passage, back to Matthew 26, it gives us an inside track into those who truly are not on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's move on to a different group. And it's just like the Lord. To sandwich in between... A group of religious frauds and a traitor, we'll get to him last, right in the middle of that, the Lord puts an account about a particular woman. Fellas, this is good for us to see this. The men in this passage are no good. The woman in this passage, she's somebody that you want to learn something from. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ to put a woman in the passage and say, you men, now you women as well, but you men, pay attention. The men got it wrong. This woman got it right. You mean the Lord can use a woman? I say amen to that. Yes. Now, they all, men have their roles in our world. According to God, so do women. Folks, and especially you men here, just because this is an account of a woman, don't you overlook this. There is the, the best of spiritual lessons from this message will probably come from this woman today. But don't miss it. Look at verse 6. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my, bur for my burial. And I'll, I'll come back and read verse 8 through 13 in a minute. But there is a whole lot here. Back in verses 8 and 9, notice that the disciples, now these are the men that have been around Jesus Christ for over three years at this point in history. The disciples, they say, they have indignation and they say, to what purpose is this what? They think that the act of this woman is a waste. Look what else they say in verse 9. For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to who? They, these men, these disciples completely miss it. Jesus Christ commends the woman. Jesus Christ rebukes these disciples. What do they have their mind on? What a waste of money. This money should have been given to who? The poor. Now, certain people have the idea that doing something for Jesus Christ is a waste of your time and energy and your money. Don't fall for that. This woman is commended by the Lord. Let me read verse, four, or verse uh, 13 here, how she's commended. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Isn't that something? Folks, it's never a waste. It's never a waste to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen to that? You're not wasting your time doing something for the Lord. 
And it doesn't matter what the rest of the world thinks. If you're doing something single-handedly, wholeheartedly for the Lord Jesus Christ, that's a good thing. And don't let somebody distract you from that. Now go over to Luke chapter 15. Keep your finger here. Let's go to Luke 15. Let me show you something here. Very interesting. Luke 15. And look at verse 13. This is what the world does. And this is what is truly a waste. Look at Luke 15, 13. This is about the prodigal son. And you know how he left his, his father and he got his inheritance. And look at verse 13. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there, what did he do? Wasted his substance with riotous living. That is purposeful wording there. This is really neat. This son, a foolish one, at least at this point, wasted his substance with riotous living. Go back to Matthew 26. What is it that this woman poured upon Jesus Christ? It's ointment. Couldn't you classify that as a substance? Isn't that interesting? This substance to the waste, to the disciples is waste. To the Lord, it is anointing. I say this because it's going to look funny. It's going to look odd to the world for you to live for Jesus Christ. But it's never a waste to do something for Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, I'm just going to ask you, have you done anything? Did you do anything? I always like to go the last seven days because I can usually remember that, but not beyond that. In the last seven days, is there anything that you can pinpoint that you did and your sole motive for doing it was, I am doing this so that Jesus Christ receives the glory. I am doing this because I'm doing it only for him. I don't care if anybody sees it. I don't care what anybody thinks about it. I don't even care if somebody says something to me that is not nice. I'm going to do it for him. Think about it. Last seven days. Now, if you came up empty... The Lord might give you another seven days. And I would say today is a great day. We consider this, a lot of people call this Holy Week. You can call it what you want. This is a great, it's the second day of the month, beginning of the month. It's a great time to say in the next seven days, when I come back next week and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I want to look back and say, I did a bunch of things for one reason. So Jesus Christ will be glorified. Make a commitment today. And maybe the Lord will put on your heart some things you can do. You got neighbors, don't you? You got friends, don't you? You got people that you work with. You can influence them in one way or another for Jesus Christ. It might start with this. Lord, I want to please you this week. I want to do something only for you this week. Will you show me what you want me to do? I guarantee you, if you're serious about that prayer, the Lord will give you opportunities to do something for him. Be a great thing for everybody here, myself at the top of the list, to say today, say, Lord, where will you take me? What do you want me to do this week that is only for you? I want to, at the end of my week, look back at the end of next week and say, Lord, I didn't care what anybody thought. I did that for you. Maybe spend some time with the Lord and ask him. I, I, I promise you he'll show you. A lot of times you just don't ask the Lord to show us. He will show you. Make a commitment to do something for the Lord. Now, I want to go back here and cover something because it's in the passage. We have to cover it. And it sure does line up with things in our world today. Look at verse 9 again. Look at the motive of these disciples for this ointment might have been sold for much and given to who watch out for people who have more concern for the poor than they do for the Lord Jesus Christ. I got to show you something real quick. You're in Matthew 26. I got to take you, go back to Luke. I should have taken you back a minute ago, but Luke 14 this time, Luke 14 and look at verse 13. Before you think, oh, the poor aren't important, I want to show you that the poor are important. But I want to put it in perspective. Look at 14.12, actually. 14.12. Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call who? The poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. I just show you that passage to show you a few others. The poor were important to the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, the poor are important to the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's put this in perspective. Back here, these disciples, go back to Matthew 26. 
The disciples are concerned for the poor. And let me just make a statement. I'm going to try not to park on it for more than 15 seconds. Watch out for both politicians and the religious crowd when they encourage you to consider the plight of the poor. Not every time, but oftentimes, this is often code word for what I would call Robin Hood economics. Let's take from the rich to give to the poor. And let's make it so that everybody's pretty much the same. Even playing field. Real quick here, you can spend your own time looking at this, but steal from the rich to give to the poor, the result being everyone's the same. There is no rich, there is no poor. Everybody has the same income, like universal basic income. Now, I say that just because you want to watch out. Find out if somebody's really concerned about the poor or not. Because in this case right here in Matthew 26, again, I could park on this for a while. I'm not going to, but look at what is far more important than the poor. The poor are important, but look who is far more important. Look at verse 11. It says, Jesus Christ talking, for ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Now back up to verse 10. I didn't read this, but I need to read the end. Look at the end of verse 10. For she hath wrought a good what? A good work on me. Folks, notice a great contrast. Notice the motive of the woman. Her single motive was, I am going to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the motive of these disciples here. We got to find out how much that cost. Somebody's got an interest in money here. Uh, now, now, hey, has the Lord blessed our church from a, a financial standpoint? Can you say amen to that? Amen, yeah, amen to that. Uh, it's enabled us. This is so neat. And very few churches are like ours in this respect. It has enabled us at certain times of the year to say, hey, we're going to take 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks, and we're going to give it to our missionaries who really, really can use it. And money is a good thing when it is used properly. But when money becomes a motive... Well, you better watch out. If you're doing something for money, even a job, I know we all have to get income and all, but I have known so many people over the years that left one job for another because it paid more and it was the worst decision of their lives because of the environment it put them in. <laughs> Got in all kinds of trouble because of the people they were around more than the other place that paid less, but it was a much better place to work. <laughs> So be careful about money being a motive. We need money. I got to buy, have money to buy food. I got money to pay the mortgage for goodness sake. That's a lot of money, isn't it? But at the same time, don't make money your God for the love of money is the root of all evil. You can trace every evil act that's ever occurred all the way back to the almighty dollar. So be careful about that. Keep money in the right perspective. Be more concerned. I'll stop with this. Be more concerned with doing something for Jesus Christ than you are about any amount of money. I think we can all say amen to that. Go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Let me show you something here. It says over there, she wrought a good work upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Ephesians 2. And I want to spend some time on this woman here because uh, she's the bright spot in the passage. You got the other things around the, the passage that surround that account that are not so great. But let's take a look at this. Look at Ephesians 2. Familiar verse, I'm going to read verses 8 and 9 because they're always good to read. Look at verse 8, it says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Can you be saved by works, folks? You're saved by faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. You say, how do you know that? The rest of the verse, and that not of yourselves. You can't earn salvation. It is the gift of God. Look at verse 9. Not of, lest any man should boast. Verse 10, now watch this. You're not saved by works. Salvation should result in good works. Look what it says. For we are his workmanship, created on Christ Jesus unto good works. Salvation first, work second, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Folks, this woman wrought a good work upon Jesus Christ. Ask the Lord what good work you can do for him this week. It's a great thing to ask the Lord to do. Show you what it is you can do solely for him, for his glory this week. Now, if we had more time here, we could do a sermon just on this woman. I'll tell you, there's some good practical lessons here. Let me just give you three really good things here. Practical lessons from this act of worship from this woman. First thing, 
The Lord knows your heart. He knows your motive for what you do. We know that this woman's motive was 100% pure. And the Lord memorialized her for it. Make sure your motives are, I'm doing this only for Jesus Christ and I don't care what anybody else thinks. That needs to be the motive. And that was her motive. Next thing here. This is a good one here. This is a message all in itself. Proper worship of the Lord Jesus Christ will cost you something. You find over in Mark's gospel, it says that the disciples say, this could have been sold for 300 pence, a large amount of money, and be given to the poor. This woman, it cost her something to obtain this precious ointment. But what had to happen before the ointment was poured out to anoint Jesus Christ? You don't want to miss this. Look back there at verse 7. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment, ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. Okay, go to Mark 14. Let me show you this. This is so neat. You've got a cross-reference to get the whole story. Sometimes you have to do that with the gospel accounts. Look at Mark 14. Look down there at verse 3. Same account, Mark 14, 3, you get more details from Mark. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of spikenard. There's the ointment. Very precious. Watch it. And she did what? Break the box and poured it on his head. Don't miss that. Something has to be broken before it can be poured out. Don't miss it. It had to be broken before it was poured out. Now, I don't like this, but this is the way God does things. I heard a preacher say this many years ago, and it could apply to a man or a woman, but I'll use it with a man. Oftentimes, God has to break a man to make a man. I'll tell you, the greatest learning experiences of my life have been the experiences where I've been humbled the most. You know what God was doing? He said, Rockwell, I got to break you down so I can use you. And I didn't like it, but I needed it. And right here, there's a great lesson. This box had to be broken first, poured out second. Folks, if you want the Lord to pour you out, he might have to break some things down first. You might have to agree with God that you need to allow some things to be broken. You got anything, anything between you and the Lord, you know what's going to have to happen? That thing's going to have to be broken if you're going to be used by him properly. What is it for you? It could be any number of things. There's a lot of things that can stand between me and you and the Lord Jesus Christ. In order for that thing to get out of the way, sometimes you got to say, I'm going to break this thing and get it out. Uh, I know several years ago, Sherry and I, and this is just one example, and you, if you want to disagree, that's okay. You can be wrong. But many years ago, uh, Sherry and I heard a really powerful message from a preacher about, and I won't say the name, I'll try not to say the name, but about a particular place that has a huge influence on Orlando, uh, magical influence on Orlando and our world. And I'll just leave it at that. You could probably read into it. And this fella connected all kinds of sorcery and witchcraft and wickedness with this particular organization. And I believe it was Sherry that actually initiated this. She says, we're getting rid of all the junk in our house associated with this place. And I said, okay, fine with me. Get it out. You say, that's extreme. Folks, I just know this. A lot of things can stand in between me and the Lord. It can be anything and it can seem innocent and it can seem harmless. But if it becomes far too influential on you, you need to break it and get it out of the way. Get it out. Over in the book of Acts, you know what they did in one place over there? They burned books. You know why they burned them? I mean, they could have taken them down to the thrift shop and resold them and made money, right? You know what they said? We don't want anybody having access to these. By the way, they were books that had to do with curious arts, sorcery, witchcraft, those kinds of things. They burned them. You know why they burned them? They said, we want them out. We don't want this to stand in between us and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know what it is. I know I got, I got my vices. You probably, if you're honest, you got yours. What is it between you and the Lord right now that you need to say, I'm getting, I'm getting this thing out. I, I'll tell you this. God can use you if you don't get it out. But he'll use you a thousand times better if you do get it out. What is it?
You, now, I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of something for me right now. <laughs> this is not in the notes, by the way. I'm thinking of something I got right now. I don't know what it is that the Lord's putting on your heart, but whatever it is, I would not go another day, another hour before getting it out. And maybe there's certain times where you need to do the breaking. Get it out. Get it out today. If you really want to do something for the Lord, if you really want to be used by the Lord, some, thing needs, some things need to be broken and cast aside, and then the Lord can pour you out the way you can really be poured out and used. Amen? Last thing here. Real devotion. This is from the woman. Lessons from this woman. There's a lot. Real devotion to Jesus Christ will certainly attract criticism from the religious crowd. You mean people in church might think I'm crazy? Yep. I'll just give you one silly example. It's a good one, though. And I say silly because the world thinks it's absolutely insane, ridiculous, and they laugh. Go out on the street with Don or Brandon or myself and hold the scripture sign. All it has is Bible verse on it. And you know what saved people will do? Church people, you know what they'll do? They'll say, what's that guy doing down there wasting his time? What a waste, they will say. And I know that Isaiah 55 says God's word never returns void. So the more I can sow God's word, whether it be a gospel track, whether it be me speaking it, whether it be holding a sign, whether it be typing something and printing it out and distributing it or however it sees fit. If I can do that, God's word goes out and God will accomplish his work with his word. Amen. The world will think you're crazy. The world will think you're wasting your time. Can I give you a three words, a little piece of advice? Ready? Ready? Three words. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. This is what it comes down to. Are you trying to please the Lord? Or are you trying to stay friends with the world? James says friendship with the world is enmity against God. Who are you more concerned with being aligned with? Something to think about. That, there's some lessons from that woman, isn't there? Wow. Brandon, next message, you can just go further with that. Take that or Don or somebody. There's a, there's a sermon there that goes 20 points long with that one. All right, let's go on here. Go back to Matthew 26. Let's wrap up here. Sandwiched in between, you got a woman. Let's wrap this thing up. Look at verse 14. And there, there'll be something good about this. I'll bring out something good. Don't worry. Verse 14, then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went into the chief priests and said unto them, what will you give me? And I will deliver him, that's the Lord, unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. What was his motive, by the way? I wonder if Judas Iscariot might have been the influence who first said something to the other disciples and got the other disciples on his side to criticize the woman. What do you think? Makes me wonder. And I say that because I believe it's over in Mark's account. He says that they began to murmur. And I know that murmuring begins with one and spreads like wildfire. I know that. So, something to think about. The motive of Judas Iscariot was money. Now, you might be thinking, how are you going to bring something good out of this thing with Judas Iscariot? Well, the last thing here has to do with betrayal. Notice his motive. Verse 15. And said unto them, what will ye give me? Who is he interested in? Looking out for number one. In his book, number one was himself. Make sure that number one for you is the Lord, not yourself. I would take you over to Exodus 21. You'd find out that 30 pieces of silver just happens to be the value of a Hebrew slave. I bring that up because that's about how much the world thinks of Jesus Christ. Not much. They think that this ointment that this woman had was more valuable than him. Now, I'm going to leave you with this. Let's go back to your Old Testament. You're in Matthew. The book before is uh, Malachi. Right before that, Zechariah. Go to Zechariah 11. Now, here's where I want to end. I want you to understand that every step taken by the Lord Jesus Christ was on purpose. And even Judas Iscariot, working out of the imaginations of his own wicked heart and doing it for himself... Guess what old Judas Iscariot ended up doing? He ended up 
fulfilling the scriptures. Isn't that something? Only God could do this. This man had no intention of doing anything for the Lord, but in, in doing what he did for himself, he fulfills the scripture. Hey, the Lord knows how things turn out, doesn't he? The Lord knows the future, doesn't he? And he will use even wicked men to accomplish his purpose. I can't explain it. I just know that's the case. Look at Zechariah 11. Look at verse, verse uh, where are we at here? Zechariah 11, I think it's 13 here. Yes, 13, 12, actually 12. And I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price, how much? 30 pieces of silver. This is uh, 533 BC. 500 years before the Lord shows up, this is written. Look at verse 13. And the Lord said unto me, cast it into the potter, a goodly price that I was priced out of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter. Where? You know what Judas Iscariot ended up doing with that 30 pieces of silver? He began to think, uh-oh, I think I made a wrong move here. And he went back to the temple, the house of the Lord. And he said to the chief priest, here's the money. And he threw it at him. How much was it? 30 pieces of silver. You mean even that particular act was in fulfillment of the scriptures? Oh, yeah. I say all this to end up where we started. Folks, you better make sure you're on the side of the scriptures. Here's what's crazy. And here's what's really interesting in the world we live in. The world, by and large, right now is against the Lord. But in going against the Lord, they will fulfill the scriptures. I got to take you to one place in closing here. Go to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. The world, in their hatred for Jesus Christ, will perfectly fulfill the scripture. Great place to end on to see what side you're on. You're on the side of the world or you're on the side of the Lord. Look at verse 1, Psalm 2, 1, and see if this does not line up with our world today. Psalm 2, 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against who? The Lord. And against who else? Isn't that interesting? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that was anointed over there in Matthew 26. That's really neat. Against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So verses 1 through 3 there, that's the world. The world is against the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, what's God think about that? Let's read verse 4. This is so great. He that sitteth in the heavens shall do what? Shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. You know what's happening right now? And it's happening behind the scenes where you don't see it. You don't even see it on the news. I mean, even Newsmax doesn't have this. They don't have what's going on behind the scenes right now so that the entire world will line up against the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever heard of the United Nations? They're only the start. The entire world is on the verge of aligning against Jesus Christ. I mean, they're almost there. And the tribulation, it really will be. But we're there. We're close to it right now. Notice it says the Lord. What's he think of that, folks? What a joke. Don't you laugh at jokes? That's what the Lord thinks of the world aligning themselves against him. What a joke. You know why it's a joke? Keep going. Verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his what? And vex them in his sore displeasure. Look at verse 5. Future event. Yet have I set my what? King upon my holy hill. Where? Zion. That's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at his second advent. Folks, in the days ahead, you need to figure out who you're going to align with. The world or the word of God. In the days ahead, what are you going to do for the Lord Jesus Christ? In the days ahead, consider the great price paid by Jesus Christ. Far more than 30 pieces of silver. Far more than the, how much the, the ointment cost. The great price paid, the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for your sins and mine. Consider that, and I'll ask you, do you know him? Today, do you know him? If you don't know him, today's a great day to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I know we got a lot of folks right here that, hey, you know him, and you came here to get a little, maybe just a little inspiration to do something for him. So here's the inspiration. Make your commitment today to live like that woman. 
instead of those men in that passage, yeah, man, this is right at us. Learn something from that woman. Live your life for the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of the cost and regardless of what everybody else thinks about you. Live your life so that Jesus Christ is exalted and nobody else. You bow your heads with me. We'll pray together. And we'll have a time where you can take some time alone with the Lord and whatever he's put on your heart today, I encourage you, don't put it off. Deal with it now. As you're sitting there just contemplating what we just went through and thinking about the uh, power of God's words, uh, is there anything that is between you and the Lord that you need to just break today? I encourage you to take care of that today, right now. Don't put it off. And if there's anybody who you're not for certain that if you were to die today, that you would be in the presence of God, we can show you. Someone can take you this morning, take you a few minutes to show you. We'll take all the time we need to show you how you can know for certain that you will spend eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you so much for just the lessons learned from this passage this morning. I just thank you that there's so much there that we didn't get to that we have... Uh, an eternity to look into and look at and study and learn. And I just thank you for your word that we will have forever, that we can forever look at and just be in all of you. I pray that your people here today would deal with things that need to break down. I pray that folks here that maybe not do not know Jesus Christ as Savior would make today the day where they trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. I pray for understanding. We pray for the work of your Holy Spirit in all of us today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.